my name is Maggie and welcome to my channel Nineteen Data. I'm currently a data scientist and a recent new grad who is working at a tech startup in the logistics space. In this channel, I share data science projects that can be easily followed by people of all skill levels, including beginners, so that you can include them in your data science portfolios and be on your way to your first data scientist job offers. I also post daily data science content on my Instagram account at Data. So be sure to check that out and let's get started. During last week's Q&A on my Instagram, many of you have asked me how I first got started on my data science portfolio. And at the time, my answer was that I didn't have to do anything extra for my portfolio. All my projects were adapted from already existing projects, such as from school or passion projects. And I also added some storytelling components to it so that it would become more complete. Now, I didn't realize this answer was a little vague. It made sense in my head at the time until I started to get questions like these. So in today's video, I would like to walk you through the two methods that you can follow to turn your existing projects, whether they're from school or whether they're personal projects, into stellar data science portfolio projects. The very first method that you can use to turn your existing assignments into stellar portfolio projects is to treat it like a research paper. The typical structure of a research paper is abstract, followed by introduction, data collected, methodology, analysis, results, and conclusion. And this is exactly how you want to add that storytelling component to your project to make it more concise, to make it more clear to the reader, and to make it more eye-catching. Now you might want to ask, why can't you just use your existing code or assignments directly plugging it into your portfolio? And I want you to imagine for a second with me how school projects work. Step one, you're introduced to this new concept in class. Step two, your professor will give you an assignment with very detailed instructions on what it wants you to do and accomplish. And step number three, you go off on your own to use data, code, data analytics to solve this question at hand. So if you were just to present the project on its own, you're essentially only presenting step number three. When a hiring manager or recruiter looking over your project and they probably only have a couple of seconds before they decide if they want to keep reading or not, they're losing that context quickly, they're losing the scope of the project and they can't tell very quickly what your project is trying to accomplish and what method that it use to solve your questions. Let me give you an example. During my fourth year in my undergrad, I took a course called Methods of Applied Statistics. I worked on a project about COVID-19 data in Quebec. I applied Bayesian inference techniques to model the data to try and understand the impacts of social inequity. I have the assignment on the screen now. As you can see, most of the effort was in the code. But when I present this to prospective employers, it doesn't mean much. Instead, I want to tell a story about the problem, how I went about solving it, and what the outcome was. Now you're seeing the data science portfolio that I personally used to get my first data scientist position, and this is my project collage page. The way my portfolio is presented, I tell the story twice. Once broadly on the project collage, and again in more detail on the project page. On the project collage, I like to demonstrate three elements. The title, the image, and the description. The title should be clear and concise while providing a meaningful description about what the project entails. For this project, I named it Statistical Proof COVID-19 is not just like the flu. The image should be aesthetically pleasing and illustrate the parameters inflating the model. And the description can be only a few lines, but should use simple language and include the methods used, as well as questions at hand. I'll show you the detailed description on the project page now. So this is my project. At the beginning of the project, I always like to include a picture that is relevant to the project and can grab your reader's attention. Here, I have a predicted and actual number of deaths in Quebec displayed over time, and you can clearly see that towards the second half of 2020, Quebec's actual mortality data is not following the seasonal variation pattern of those in previous years. And in the case of this specific portfolio project, the picture at the very beginning acts also as my abstract section. 
so moving on, followed by the abstract is my introduction, where I started by writing the COVID-19 global pandemic reached Canada in early March, blah, blah, blah. This is where I provide a broader context of the problem I'm trying to solve and why it matters. I also included my two hypotheses that one, during the first wave from March to May, the epidemic primarily affected the elderly, and two, the second wave from September to October was mainly caused by young people acting irresponsibly. Now that it's clear to the reader what problems I'm trying to find answers to, naturally as a next step, they would want to know what data I used as well as a robust methodology section. This is where I want to establish my authority and instill confidence in my approach. For data, I mentioned I used public available data provided by the government of Quebec with a link that readers can actually click on to try it out for themselves. This is then followed by a very detailed description of my method. I bolded my main method, which is a Bayesian inference techniques with semi-parametric smooth time trend um, and a Poisson model. And I also have the mathematical equations that I wrote supporting my model, along with what each parameter means in the context of COVID-19. Last but not least, I attached a snippet of my code for how my model was actually run in R. This is a very important section and you should definitely spend a good chunk of your time on because your data scientist hiring manager will be technical and they will want to read this in details. For the rest of my projects, I have the remaining results and conclusion section. My results section were divided by my two hypothesis questions. I either accepted or rejected my hypothesis with a combination of graphs and text, as well as some tables and the code that I used to generate and organize my results. Lastly, my discussion is relatively brief, where I summed up my whole project and acknowledged limitations as well as next steps. So this example was a little bit dry and very technical. So let me show you one more example of my passion project on data visualization. In this project, I compare movie ratings from critics and audiences. Similar to the other project, I, um, as you can see that on the project collage page, I included a title, an image, and a description. And my image is actually the data visualization output itself. On the project page, we can see the visualization in more detail. I think it's really neat how we can tell a story through this image and the types of movies and where audiences and critiques taste diverge from one another. The way I structure the presentation of this project is I indicated the purpose of analysis through a little section called main takeaway and snippets of codes where um, people can follow to get to the visualizations themselves. So I want to talk a little bit more about this project. The visualization aims to show the discrepancy between critics' opinion and audiences' opinion on the same movies. Generated, generated from the data set provided on movies filmed in Toronto. This visualization uses three main scores. IMDB ratings, voted by the general audience, Rotten Tomato scores, which are voted by critics, and Metacritic score, which is voted by also critics, but the scores are weighted based on the reputation of the critics, so it's more reputable. The graph also depicts the number of nominations through the size or area of circles, movies which are loved by critics but disliked by the audience, which are on the left side of the graph. Those movies received more nominations than movies which are loved by audience and disliked by critics, which are on the right side of the graph. And titles of movies on the extreme side of the scale were also provided for reference. The rest of the projects are just code that you need to wrangle the data and prepare them for visualization, as well as the required R packages and some styling specifics. Let's now move on to the second method. The second method follows the core framework of the first method, which is to treat it like a research paper. But instead of writing it out and dividing it into different sections, you can use the external tool to make it look a bit more appealing to the eyes. 
The project that I present using this method studies the difference in urban enclaves in Toronto, which is this one right here. It is a capstone research project conducted by me and my colleagues using cluster analysis in GIS and GLMM regression modeling in R. The tool that I used for this project is StoryMap by Esri. This external tool combines attributes from a typical slideshow with some of the spatial elements we know and love from Esri's other products like ArcGIS. So for this project, I started off with background of the research questions with some pictures on the side. The research question itself, which is very well formatted. And then I show study areas in relationship to each other and on the map. In the data acquisition section, I have the logos of the companies where we got our data from. For methodology, I have a flow chart of what methods that we used and what we did with the data. So we used cluster analysis, we used ANOVA, and then we used a generalized linear mixed regression model. Results section is text accompanied by charts and maps. And then we have our discussion section for each geographic area respectively and conclusions. And lastly, growth, which is what I learned from doing this project. The advantages of this method are the interactive feature of the presentation, which involves reader more than just text or text and images through the bar on the top, where you can easily switch between sections. This is the end of the video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you learned something new and leave a question in the comment section below or come say hi on Instagram. Until next time.